Hi, I'm Sandra Cajon Chu, and I'm with the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network. And I think Emily mentioned we're a human rights organization based in Toronto. And one of the principal areas of my work is prison uh, needle and syringe programs and prison health harm reduction and advocacy for these programs um, since essentially the start of my work there. Um, I wanted to start off my presentation with a quote that I think is something that our federal government sorely is it's neglecting this, their responsibility and something I wanted just to sort of underscore. Uh, this is a quote from UNAIDS from 1996. Um, governments have a moral and legal responsibility to prevent the spread of HIV among prisoners and prison staff and to care for those infected. And just to jump to the second part, prisoners are the community. They come from the community, they return to it. Protection of prisoners is protection of our communities. And um, this is unfortunately something that's sort of underlined all our work in the last 20 years at the legal network, um, something that the federal government forgets when they're dealing with people in prison. So to give some context, I think these numbers, after hearing Ruth's presentation, and, and I know talking to many people who've been incarcerated, that these numbers are very conservative. But this comes from um, studies, a national study that was conducted in 2007, published in 2010. And it shows that HIV and hepatitis C prevalence in the federal system is at least 10 and 30 times higher in prison than it is in the community. These numbers are higher for federally incarcerated women, and they're higher for indigenous people in prison. And some of the numbers are astounding. Um, for indigenous women in the federal system, almost one in two is infected with hepatitis C. Their numbers are significantly higher for HIV as well. Um, one in six people in the federal system report having injected drugs in the last six months in prison. I think this is a conservative estimate. Um, and, and among the people who actually injected drugs, half of them used, they shared a needle, and a third of them shared it with someone they knew had HIV or hepatitis C, or unknown infection status. And these numbers are sort of um, replicated in the global research on injection drug use in prison. Um, when you look at some of the literature reviews, um, up to 75% of people who have a history of injection drug use continue to inject drugs when they're incarcerated. So there, the myth that there's no drugs in prison or that people just simply don't inject is untrue. And, um, and interestingly, up to one quarter of people who inject drugs actually begin injecting drugs in prison. I know there's been research in Canada that actually bears this out as well. Um, and so we know in Canada that needle and syringe programs are, have been operating for over 25 years. They're considered a key part of comprehensive response to HIV and hepatitis C prevention among people who inject drugs. Um, and in the Canadian federal prison system, there are some harm reduction measures. There's actually harm reduction measures that talk about cleaning injection equipment. There's bleach. Um, it's part of the federal policy commissioner's directive that bleach is available in three discrete locations in each federal institution. The difference between policy and practice is obvious in many institutions, but that's the policy. They're supposed to have it in three discrete locations, and it's meant as a harm reduction measure. It's meant to sterilize injection equipment. So the government recognizes that injection drug use is happening, and so they're providing bleach as a completely inadequate response. Um, there's OST, opiate substitution therapy, methadone, um, continuation and initia initiation, and there's also condoms, dental dams, and lubricant in the federal system. But um, in over 20 years since these programs have existed outside of Canada, there, there aren't any in Canada. There's no prison needle and syringe programs here in federal or provincial institutions. So what is the federal government's rationale for rejecting them? Um, we can only speculate, although I've heard some of these played out in the media. Um, the government says they don't want to be seen as condoning drug use in prison. And this is um, reinforced in their commissioner's directive 585, which was instituted in 2007 which was the start of their national anti-drug strategy. Um, and so they say in this commissioner's directive, a safe, drug-free institutional environment is a fundamental condition for the success of the reintegration of inmates into society as law-abiding citizens. So it would be very inconsistent if they were to provide uh, needle and syringe programs, they would be in their mind to be promoting drug use potentially. Um, another concern that's been flagged by, mo not so much by the government, but by correctional officers who work inside is that it might lead to an increase in violence and the use of syringes as weapons against prisoners or staff. A third concern is that it will lead to increased drug use, increased drug injection. And finally, simply that it just wouldn't work in Canada because we have a unique institutional or correctional environment here that's very different from the other places where these programs exist. Where do these programs exist? So they've been um, working very well in, or for over 20 years in at least eight countries. Um, so you see 
the eight countries up there, um, including Switzerland, which we'll hear shortly from Daniela on. Um, these are well-resourced prison systems, less well-resourced prison systems. They're in women's and men's institutions, civilian institutions, military institutions, remand um, centers, um, and so all sorts of, there's a diversity of institutions in which they operate. There's, there's absolutely no reason why they wouldn't work in Canada. And there have been studies of the prison needle and syringe programs in um, three countries, in Switzerland, Germany, and um, Spain. And so this is sort of a compilation of some of the outcomes. In all, every single prison system where these programs exist, syringe sharing has been strongly reduced. And there has been no increase in drug use at all. And there has been no increase in drug injection. And in fact, there hasn't been a single uh, conversion of HIV in any of the institutions where they exist. And I note there's one case of hep C um, transmission. Um, nor have the negative conse consequences actually materialized. Um, there's been not, no increase in drug use or drug injection in any of these programs. No increase in institutional violence. And there hasn't been a single documented case of a needle being used as a weapon against staff or prisoners. Not a single case. And you have to recall that these, pres these programs have been ex in existence since 1992. And finally, there hasn't been an increase in needle stick injuries. In fact, um, a lot of the prison staff who work in these programs would, would say that they're actually safer under these programs because no, no, now they're no longer being stuck accidentally by something that's been passed around by 30, 40, 50 people. We've heard from Julie and others about how often these needles are used and shared and how dangerous they are. In the programs where they exist, you know that they're, um, there's one person who, who uses it, and they're often kept in a secure place. So um, correctional officers, will, when they're searching a cell, they won't necessarily be stuck with it because it's either on the wall or somewhere where they're supposed to keep it, where it's mandated. So the conclusions about these programs are that they're feasible, they're affordable across a wide range of prison settings. They decrease syringe sharing and therefore decrease the risk behaviors that lead to HIV and hepatitis C transmission. Um, they contribute to workplace safety. Um, they lead to a decrease in abscesses. And they actually facilitate referrals to drug dependence treatment programs. That's a really interesting observation that I thought uh, think will be sort of contrary to the, to the war on drugs message. It's actually promoting, um, promoting it's it fostering a relationship of trust with healthcare staff so prisoners um, are more likely to enter these dependence, dependence treatment programs. And there's a lot of different methods that they employ that there's no reason why they wouldn't work in Canada. And they can successfully coexist with drug prevention treatment programs. All of this has been documented for um, many, many years by my organization and others. And this is just an illustration of, of the different reports that we produce over the years that we've always, in every case, sent to um, the correctional, uh, sorry, the commissioner, the CSC commissioner, to heads of public safety, the ministers of health um, over the years. And so this is information they have before them and they're totally aware of. Um, we've also done a lot of lobbying before um, parliamentary bodies, um, in the Ministerial Council on HIV AIDS, before House of Commons standing committees, sharing all the information that's been accumulated over the last 20 years about the evidence for prison needle and syringe programs. We've done advocacy before the media, um, articles in correctional magazines, letters to the editor, media interviews, especially um, when our court case was launched in 2012 to describe the rationale for um, the litigation and, and some of the really um, horrifying statistics that propelled it. And some public education uh, campaigns, including a video advocacy series. I think Emily mentioned Prison Health Now is one of the websites that the legal network hosts. And this includes uh, a number of uh, vignettes of um, family members and friends and loved ones of prisoners describing why it's so important for the people inside to have access to these programs. And we presented in numerous places um, trying to make the case for these programs. And in Canada and internationally, these programs have been supported by a vast array of organizations. I've just outlined sort of the health and human rights ones mostly the national ones here, but many, many, many organizations have endorsed them. Um, and you'll see internationally, UNAIDS, the World Health Organization, UNODC, the High Commissioner on Human Rights, they've all endorsed prison needle and syringe programs. So let's revisit the reasons why the government doesn't want to have these programs in place. They don't want to be seen as condoning drug use in prison. 
So we've already heard that drug use and drug injection does not increase as a result of these programs. And in fact, there's increased referrals to drug treatment programs. Um, the increase in violence and the use of syringes as weapons against prisoners and staff, that hasn't been borne out by the evidence in over 20 years. There hasn't been an increase in drug use, and there's absolutely no reason why these programs won't work in Canada. And that's one of the reasons why we have this national um, convening in the next two days. We're going to make sure that we develop some kind of preliminary framework so that they are effective in Canada and we won't have situations like rusty bleach or you know, bleach dispensers being placed in front of guard stations. So in light of that, um, over 20 years of advocacy, research, all of this the government is fully aware of. In 2012, a year and a half ago, we launched a lawsuit against the federal government um, for, because of its refusal to implement prison needle and syringe programs. It involves my organization, um, PASAN, Katie, the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, and a man who was formerly incarcerated in an Ontar in Ontario federal institution. He was infected with hepatitis C when um, another person in the prison took his needle without his knowledge and used it, and he got infected. And it was a very strong case because he was um, one of the very vigilant people who got tested when he went into the prison system and was continually tested for every six months after. So there's no doubt that he was actually infected when he was inside. Um, so his infection would have been entirely preventable. He was a pure health worker. He was very aware of the risks of sharing injection equipment, and he was very careful, but it just happened that someone had used his um, equipment unbeknownst to him. So this case, um, we filed the first series of affidavits um, in September, and we're about to file a second series of expert evidence um, in the spring. And this will involve um, evidence from experts in Canada, outside, people who work in the prison system, um, a diversity of opinions, but they all share the same um, uh, expert opinion that there should be prison needle and syringe programs in Canada, and there's no reason why they shouldn't exist. So um, I'm happy to answer a few more questions about the lawsuit if you have any. Um, thank you. <laughs>